Hi, John. Now that we have a new requirement to have professional indemnity insurance in order to renew APC, I'm hearing many new options from many insurers. Can you quickly tell me about Dr. Shield and why it is best for me? Please keep your explanation to less than two minutes. When you start with us, it is important that all your historic liabilities are covered if the claim arises for the first time after you start with us. Should you retire or cease operations, you will be able to choose the unlimited runoff coverage that will protect you from liabilities arising in the future without requiring to pay premiums every year thereafter. We are the only scheme that allows you to engage the lawyer of your choice. In the event that you don't have a lawyer, you will be represented by our panel of carefully handpicked lawyers straight away. We charge a flat rate for all government doctors and specialists doing locum, regardless of their classification. An extraordinary deal for government doctors doing locum. For clinic owners registered as Sundarian Burhat, we provide clinic indemnity online for easy add-on to stay properly protected. We offer an option for auto reinstatement, double your coverage at 10% of your premiums. We fully support mediation as a preferred way of conflict resolution, minimizing the stress for all parties. We pay for aggravated damages and regulators' inquiries. This can sneak up when we least expect it. Always good to ensure this cover for peace of mind. We insure against personal accident and cover public relation costs for crisis management. We insure against cyber and data privacy loss. This includes loss of documents too. Lastly, you can get your instant codes and buy your policy within 10 minutes. You can renew your policy within 2 minutes. No printing of PDFs, no signing, no scanning, no account creation. We just want to make it easy for you. Giving you the assurance on your insurance. Wow, thank you John, that was insightful. Welcome to the first of our series of medical legal webinars, proudly organized by OGSM and sponsored by Dr. Shield. To kickstart our inaugural webinar, we have chosen a topic that reflects the uncertainties that medical professionals face as we provide medical care to patients during this pandemic. Medical legal issues will change with the new normal, and we hope that these issues will be addressed today. As with medicine, the opinions expressed today should not be viewed as a legal consultation, as every individual case may be different. Please consult a lawyer before acting on a legal issue. To start our webinar, we will start with an opening address from the organizer, organizer of this webinar and President-elect of OGSM, Dr. Murali Ganesigalingam. Dr. Murali is currently a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist at Hospital Ampang, and has served the public sector in Malaysia for more than 30 years. He obtained his uh, basic medical degree from Stanley Medical College, University of Madras, and his postgraduate qualification from the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. He is currently a fellow of the RCOG and has a fellowship in advanced obstetrics and gynecology. He has also got a postgraduate diploma in medical law from the University of Northumbria and is a certified mediator of the Bar Council Mediator Centre. 
Dr. Morali currently holds the post as head of obstetrics and gynecology in the hospital Ampang and is also the head of obstetric and gynecological services for the state of Selangor. He has an interest in gynecological oncology and high-risk uh, high obstetrics. So without much further ado, we'd like to proceed to let Dr. Morali give his opening address. Hello and uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us today. Now, uh, as uh, Dr. Lowe told us earlier, this is the first of, I hope, a series of uh, medical legal uh, based seminars, webinars that we can have. And we chose uh, COVID-19 for the obvious reasons. Now, we have tried uh, to get together a faculty of speakers who will be able to address and uh, all your issues, as well as give you an overview of what to expect and what not to expect. Now, uh, pandemics are not new. Pandemics have been there for a long time. And pandemics have been, and we have learned lots of lessons from pandemics. Quarantine, for example, which is one of the uh, uh, bedrocks of uh, how we manage pandemics, has been there since the time uh, since the time of the Black Flu. And uh, during the Black Flu, for it, uh, when, when surges, uh, so the sailors returned from, uh, uh, from abroad, they were quarantined for about 30 days on their ships before they ever get to uh, come on to land. And these were all reasons, that, these were all lessons that we learned about pandemics. And pandemics hold, in, our, in, in the current environment, pandemics hold a, a challenge to the manner in which we deal with medical legal uh, issues. Now, traditionally, uh, individuals did not have as much rights as we now see in uh, we practice today. Now, what we see today, uh, whether it is uh, human rights or whether it's uh, patient's rights or patient autonomy, are all based on the individual. That means the law today is framed in a manner whereby the individual is taken care of and is uh, the main participant and all issues revolve around him. Pandemics, they change this milieu. They change it because in a pandemic, what comes into, uh, into play is public health. And the laws that govern public health are laws that take the environment or the society uh, or the community uh, primarily and the individual is pushed down uh, the ladder to a secondary role. Therefore, this fundamental difference in the manner in which the law behaves is, I think, something important that you must remember before you watch the seminar, simply because this is going to uh, 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 help you with the manner, with, with the understanding of what's being said today. Now, with this said, I think we should carry on and uh, uh, go on to the seminar. So I will pass you on back to uh, Dr. Wen, who is the moderator, to address, uh, to, to introduce this first speaker. I hope you have an uh, excellent time, and I hope it is. Uh, you, you, you find this uh, educational and uh, help, uh, I hope this helps you with your practice in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marley. We shall now proceed with our first symposium entitled Virtual Consultations in the Law. With the pandemic, clinicians are encouraged to move towards teleconsultations. This poses a new set of problems as patient diagnoses and care are often based on just an online consultation. To give our first talk, we have Mr. David Timothy Kanagaratnam, who is a legal associate of Messrs. Jayadeep, Hari, and Jamil. He is here to represent Mr. Hari Kanan Raghavan today, who is unable to attend as he has a family emergency. So, Mr. David Timothy Kanagaratnam actually holds a Bachelor of Laws degree from Cardiff University and is currently a barrister at law and an advocate and solicitor of the High Court of Malaya. He practices in the areas of general civil litigation, including medical and dental malpractice, and has assisted in medical and dental inquiries at the Malaysian Medical Council and the Malaysian Dental Council as well. We are pleased to welcome Mr. David Timothy Kanagaratnam to give his talk entitled Teleconferencing Legal Implications. Hello, everyone, and a very good afternoon to each and every one of you. 
Now, um, for our first topic today, I'm going to be talking about teleconferencing and its legal implications. Now, um, given that teleconferencing falls within the ambit of telemedicine, I will be addressing telemedicine as a whole. Um, so for my talk today, I will basically address three issues. The first is what is telemedicine? The second, the duty of care. And finally, the standard of care. So what is telemedicine? Um, according to the World Medical Association, telemedicine is the practice of medicine over a distance in which interventions, diagnosis, therapeutic decisions, and subsequent treatment recommendations are based on patient data, documents, and other information transmitted through telecommunication systems. So essentially what this means is that telemedicine is the use of telecommunications technology to provide healthcare remotely. So whenever a doctor and a patient are in a situation where they're not physically present with each other, telemedicine can basically be used as a medium to administer treatment. Now, um, the next issue that I will be addressing is whether there are, in fact, any laws in Malaysia which actually govern the use of telemedicine. In Malaysia, the government of Malaysia has enacted the Telemedicine Act 1997, which is basically an act to regulate the conduct of telemedicine in this country. Now, under Section 2 of the Telemedicine Act 1997, um, telemedicine means the practice of medicine using audio, visual, and data communications. And this would include doctors giving medical advices, prescriptions to the patients, or exchanging opinions with other medical experts via phone calls, video calls, emails, and et cetera, basically. Now, um, if we move on and look at the Act, the Act further defines two types of healthcare professionals that can actually administer telemedicine. Now, the first is local doctors, and the second is a medical practitioner who is registered of license outside Malaysia, but holds a certificate to practice telemedicine issued by the Malaysian Medical Council and practices telemedicine from outside Malaysia through a local doctor. So the next issue that I would like to address is, can the use of telemedicine be done as of right? Or are there any conditions which must be satisfied in order for a doctor to administer telemedicine? Under Section 5 of the Telemedicine Act 1997, it states that the patient's written consent must be obtained before the practice of telemedicine. And valid written consent from a patient is considered, written consent is considered valid from a patient in the sense that the patient must be known, must be given the information that they are allowed to withdraw their consent anytime without prejudicing future care. The patient must be made known of potential risks consequences and the benefits of telemedicine. There must be valid doctor and patient confidentiality protection during te the telemedicine. And also any image or information of the patient will not be shared to any individual. Therefore, this would mean that in order for a medical practitioner to actually administer treatment via telemedicine, um, this can only be done once the patient gives their approval and they are informed of the various factors which I have just mentioned. So the next issue that I would like to consider is the duty of care. Now, does a doctor owe a patient a duty of care when he administers treatment via telemedicine? By virtue of the doctor and patient relationship that exists between the two parties, a doctor would owe a duty of care to his patient. Without the doctor and patient relationship, there is no duty of care on the part of the doctor to diagnose, advise, and treat his patient. And this was one of the issues that was addressed in the case of Fu Fiona and Dr. Suk Fuk Moon in the year 2007. So in terms of this doctor and patient relationship, is there a doctor and patient relationship in telemedicine interactions? And can a doctor and patient relationship actually exist through the internet. 
these are next two issues which I will focus on. Now, in Malaysia, there aren't any cases which talk about uh, the use of telemedicine, so we would have to actually have to look at other jurisdictions. Now, in the US, in the case of Wheeler versus Yeti Kirsting Memorial Hospital, um, in this case, uh, Dr. Rodriguez had ordered the plaintiff who was in labor to be transferred to a hospital after obtaining information through the phone. Now, the court held that there is a doctor and patient relationship as Dr. Rodriguez had evaluated the patient's condition and recommended treatment through the phone. Now, if we look at the aforementioned case, the same analogy can be drawn for telecommunicate telemedicine interactions between doctors and patients. This would mean that maybe minimal contacts between doctors and patients would suffice to establish a doctor and patient relationship for medical negligence through telemedicine. Now, given that we have established that a medical practitioner owes a duty of care to their patient when administrating treatment via telemedicine, the next issue that I would like to consider is the standard of care. Now, if we look at the standard of care, in this case, Zul Hasnimar Binti Hassan Basri and another versus Dr. Kuku Belubani. Um, in this case, um, what the court has done is that they have made a distinction between diagnose and treatment in medicine and the duty to advise the patient of risk. So basically, for the ambit that falls within diagnosis and treatment, what the court would do is that they would rely on expert evidence when coming to a decision. And this was based on the Bolum test, um, which was qualified in another case called Bolito. Um, for the advice on risk, the courts are now are able to determine this on their own. And this was established in the case of Rogers versus Whitaker. Now, if we look further at diagnosis and treatment, in the Bolum test, as qualified in Bolito, the court has concluded that the court would accept the views of a responsible body of men skilled in a particular discipline, and the court, not, the court cannot resolve differences of expert opinions on its own. So therefore, the court will examine the expert evidence to see if it's capable of withstanding logical analysis when coming to a decision. If we look at the ambit of risk and complications, in the case of Rogers and Whitaker, as propounded in the local case here in Malaysia, Fu Fiona, um, the courts have stated that doctors must take reasonable care to ensure that the patient is aware of any material risk involved in, in any recommended treatment and any reasonable alternative or variant treatments. Now, um, coming back to this issue of standard of care, um, the next issue that I would like to address is if there are any guidelines actually in Malaysia to regulate the standard of care of doctors. Now, the MMC has come up with guidelines in regard to telemedicine. And in paragraph six, what the MMC has stated is that there are certain considerations that must be given to maintain a high standard of care. And the considerations that each doctor would have to take into account are as follows. The doctor has to consider whether the telemedicine medium affords adequate assessment of the presenting problem. And if it does not, they must arrange for a timely in-person assessment. The doctor must also explain the appropriateness, the limitations, and privacy issues. Further, they must, the doctor must also provide an appropriate medical assessment based on current symptoms, conditions, past histories, and medications. The doctor must create and maintain medical records of the consultation, and they must further ensure that patients and other healthcare providers have enduring access to their medical records. If we look at what the Malaysian Medical Association has provided under their code of medical ethics, um, primarily section two, part 12, the Malaysian Medical Association has stated that consultation and prescribing by email, in essence, telemedicine interaction, may seriously compromise the standards of care if the patient is not previously known to the doctor, there is little or no appropriate monitoring of the patient for follow-up care, and in the event that the patient cannot be examined. 
therefore we can conclude that here in Malaysia there are regulations that have been put into place to regulate the use of telemedicine. However, in the absence of any case law at the moment, these guidelines would have to be relied on until there is a case actually comes up to court. So to conclude my first presentation for today, Basically, there are laws in Malaysia which govern the use of telemedicine, which is the Telemedicine Act, and the MMC and MMA have come up with guidelines that can be followed for the administration of telemedicine. However, there is no case law in Malaysia at this moment that provides that specific requirements for doctors when they practice telemedicine. However, based on the MMC guidelines, as mentioned earlier, it does appear that the standard of care would be the same as the ones applied in traditional medical negligence cases. And that will be all for my first presentation today. If any one of you would require further information or would like further reading materials, please do not hesitate to email me um, at my email address, david at jhj.com, and I would be more than happy to assist each and every one of you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. David. Our next esteemed speaker, um, Associate Professor Ganesh Ramachandran is the Deputy Dean of Academic Affairs of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology of Massa University, Malaysia. Associate Professor Ganesh is an obstetrician and gynecologist by training and is a Fellow of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. He also holds a Certificate in Medical and Health Science Education from the University of Hong Kong. Since joining academia, Dr. Ramachandran has been actively involved in medical education activities in the faculty. He is a committee member of the Malaysian Association for Education in Medical and Health Sciences and a member of the Medical Educators Network of Malaysia. Without further ado, we shall now proceed with our next talk of the symposium entitled The Role of Teleconsultation on the Management of Follow-up Patients During a Pandemic. Can we please uh, welcome? Afternoon. Yes, hi. Well, please welcome Associate Professor Ganesh Ramachandran. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Ganesh Ramachandran and I am attached to Massa University. Uh, my remit over the next couple of minutes is to talk about the role of telecommunication in the management of follow-up patients during a pandemic. Um, before I begin, I think all of us are aware that uh, our clinical practice rests on an ethical framework uh, of four principles, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. This, these four principles where a patient is given a right to decide on the care that he or she receives, that there should be as any act that is taken during clinical practice should be of benefit we should not do harm and that there should be uh, equal access to right to medical care for all patients. And in when we talk about medical uh, negligence, all of us as doctors, when we undertake uh, care of a patient, we establish a contract or a duty of care. And when the duty of care is breached, and the breach causes a damage, then the patient is entitled for some form of compensation. Before I begin, I would like to just define teleconsultation or virtual consultation. Uh, teleconsultation refers to a form of medical service that is provide, provided remotely during using information and communication technology. And the point that I'd like to make is that when you talk about a remote uh, communication, it implies that there is no physical contact, but it does not necessarily mean that there is a long distance between uh, the patient and the doctor. A lot of the things that I'm going to talk about is based on the MMC advisory on uh, teleconsultation. And this advisory, is also based on a framework that comes out from the Canadian Medical Association on Telecommunication and Medicine. 
The MMC advisory states that the use of technology does not alter the ethical, professional, and legal requirements for provision of care. So anything that goes for a face-to-face -face consultation to a large extent must hold through for a teleconsultation as well. And as the previous speaker alluded to, in the absence of case law, we really need to base our actions on the guidelines that have been provided by the council. When you engage in, in a teleconsultation, the practitioner must have appropriate liability protection in place. Capacity to manage patients remotely and capacity to uh, use technology appropriately are very important when we embark on uh, telecommunication. The identity of people involved in a teleconsultation must be very clear. The doctor, the patient, and if there is anyone else, there must be a clear uh, purpose for that person, and the presence of that person must be acknowledged by both the patient as well as the treating doctor. All ethical and legal requirements that are required of a physical face-to-face -face consultation must also be met. Before we embark on, on uh, a telemedicine or a teleconsultation, you have to make a judgment as to whether, whether telemedicine is an adequate tool. If it is found that telemedicine is probably not appropriate, then we have to make alternative arrangements to continue that consultation face to face. Both parties must understand what can and cannot be done, and both parties must understand what can and cannot be achieved so that expectations are realistic and in good faith. An assessment is made on the current condition, past history, and other available evidence because, to a large extent, a physical examination may not be possible when you are on a teleconsult. Just like we maintain records for any consultation that we see uh, when we see patients in clinics, you have to maintain these records. They have to be created and they have to be maintained at all times. And these records must be accessible to both the patient and to any other medical prof health professional who may be taking care of the patient uh, over that period. If a referral is required, there must be good communication between all treating physicians with a clear indication as who is the lead physician, as well as the patient being aware of all people who are involved in his or her care. There must be clear follow-up instructions as to what needs to be done and where that can be done. And if there are any problems that occur after hours, the patient must clearly know where she or he can obtain this care. Just because this is a teleconsultation, it does not mean that a patient does not require the same standard as would be seen during a face-to-face, -face, and all patients must be adequately investigated. If you have not personally examined the patient, it is very important that you take a lot of care when you provide advice and prescriptions. That is why, to a large extent, telemed consultations are advised usually when um, uh, for follow-up. You need to be very cautious when you want to offer telemedicine, teleconsultations to a new patient because a lot of the information may not be available. And the fact that you have, do not examine the patient may also impact some of the decisions that you make. If the patient has a cognitive impairment, if there is a language barrier, or if you are worried about intoxication issues, an online consult may not be the best way to manage this patient. And if 
in your judgment, this sort of problem exists, it is advisable that we convert the teleconsultation to a face-to-face -face consultation. I'm sorry about that uh, a little glitch. In, even in the best of cases, I think sometimes things go wrong. But the bottom line is that a virtual consult is best seen as part of continued care. Uh, its use in a first encounter with a patient must be with a lot of caution. All professional and legal requirements required in a face-to-face -face consultation must be adhered to. The use of this mode of treatment can provide some amount of triaging and can reduce congestion of a physical facility, especially when you are faced with a pandemic. The rights of the patient are paramount and they must be protected at all times. Both the doctor and the patient must understand that there is limited or no physical examination possible and a lot of uh, decisions are made based on the history and uh, uh, the, 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 the past medical history, the presenting complaint and the medication history of the patient. And as such, it must be recognized that the diagnosis that we arrive at is based on good faith, uh, recognizing the limitations. And if all the information is not available, and if you as the treating physician feel that a physical examination is important before you can commit to a management plan, then that must be the way we do things. We do not commit to a management plan if all the information is not available. I'd like to conclude by showing this slide, which we use when we teach medical students today about professionalism. And really, this is what underpins any type of practice that we, any form of practice that we undertake in medicine. For us to be good doctors, we must have good competence. We must have good communication skills. We must understand the ethical and legal implications of everything that we do. And we must base our care on four principles. We must aim for excellence in whatever we do. There must be a humanistic element to the care that we provide. We are always accountable for uh, the patient and we must exercise altruism in our care. And whether it is a face-to-face -face communication or a communication through a telecommunication device, these four principles hold true. We have to be professional and we have to be as professional as we are when we provide a face-to-face -face consult when we are online uh, communicating with a, a patient through a, a, a computer or a phone. This concludes my talk and if there are any questions, we can take it during the open forum. My email is ganesh at masa.edu.my. A lot of this talk is based on material from the Malaysian Medical Council uh, Advisory on Telemedicine, and that derives a, a greatly from uh, the Canadian uh, guidelines. There are also a lot of guidelines that have come out from the American Medical Association and the British Medical Association, which you may be interested in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. That was a very insightful talk. And uh, we will now open up the floor for the Q&A session. Um, to join our Q&A discussion, please log on to uh, www.slido.com, enter the event code hash OGSM2020, or you can use your phone and scan the QR code to join in our Q&A discussion. 
Um, I think that there were quite a few, that there must be a few questions based on the talks that we've just had from our two speakers. So we are looking out for the questions now. Okay. So again, um, to log on, uh, please log on to www.slido.com with the put in the event code which is hash OGSM 2020 or you could actually just use your phone and scan the QR code which is at the bottom of the screen here today. So please send in your questions for the Q&A discussion today. Yes, when uh, while you're waiting for the questions, can I just ask uh, a few, uh, you know, uh, since we have some time, can I just uh, ask Dr. Ganesh a question? Yes, please, it's, yes. No, uh, Ganesh, actually, the, uh, uh, I'm interested in how uh, medical colleges approach uh, the, the uh, legal issues that involve the practice of medicine. Do you all have specific classes? Do you all uh, uh, teach them on what to do if something were to go wrong? Um, yes. And I think that's that's the good thing about, about uh, the way medicine is taught today. Uh, when I was a medical student, uh, we were sort of uh, taught that all this is something that we learn on the job. And I think all of us know, because Murli and me are almost the same vintage or pedigree or whatever you want to say, we know how difficult it was when we had to actually uh, confront uh, professional, ethical, and legal issues. And it's very good that the Malaysian Medical Council now mandates that all students undergo uh, some uh, coursework in uh, medical jurisprudence and ethics. And I think that is recognized now all over the world. So that uh, part of the training of a doctor is uh, uh, personal and professional development and um, that professionalism in medicine is something that I've become quite interested in over the last uh, couple of years and actually if you look at it this has been uh, the, the first work on professionalism actually occurred uh, in the 19th century uh, in England and where they actually looked at what happened to doctors as they went along they actually uh, began to talk about what it actually meant to be a professional um, but a lot of it over the years was by osmosis. We thought that it would, but most of the time it didn't. And they also found out that um, doctors who actually get into trouble later in, in, in their career usually had problems with professionalism right from the time they were in medical school. And this is work that has come out from Canada. This is work that has come out from the United States as well as Britain. All three, all three have the same uh, have got found the same results. So it is very important. Professionalism is not something that uh, we inherit. People feel that professionalism and ethics cannot be taught, but actually it can. And uh, all of us learn best by looking at how our seniors behave. So it's very important that as uh, senior doctors, or we actually walk the talk as well, because uh, uh, students will do as we do so i think the, the 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 short answer is yes there is there is there is a program now in all medical schools in one way in one form or another and uh, do you all indemnify your students in malaysia the process of indemnifying students is still very new uh, there are already moves that students need to be indemnified you know, but uh, uh, I believe that, you know, in, in the years to come, this will become compulsory. Right now, I think uh, many schools do not indemnify their students yet, but there are already moves that all students need to be indemnified uh, when, they, when they go to their clinical years. When? Okay. Hi. Yes. All right. We do have a question, um, actually. Uh, the question is, um, in your opinion, is there a potential of new cases being managed through uh, telemedicine only in the future? What type of cases would it be? So new cases uh, to be managed via telemedicine. Yeah, can I, uh, would you like to answer it? Maybe you should. 
Okay. Can I answer that? Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, I think I think Dr. Ganesh uh, uh, addressed that issue a little in his talk. Now, uh, you've got to understand that obstetrics and gynecology is a very hands-on uh, uh, discipline. There are many things that you can do. Uh, 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 there are not many things that you can do by just listening to a person's complaints. You just take the example of a 42-year-old lady who comes and tells you that she's bleeding excessively. You know, so she's in that framework, uh, that age group where things can go wrong. She could have a malignancy. She could have some nothing. It could just be a hormonal imbalance. Therefore, lots of things that that uh, we uh, 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 practice as a discipline cannot be managed through telecommunication. But uh, triaging patients, ensuring who comes when, uh, trying to deal with follow-up patients on uh, with telecommunication. I think those things can still be done uh, through through uh, through. Uh, uh, or through the uh, through the web or internet. Ganesh, anything? Yeah, yeah. I think I think I, I echo that, and I think uh, uh, um, the the most important thing is that you realize that at in its present form, teleconsultation to a large extent it has several limitations, and I think in obstetrics and gynecology, the limitations can be quite profound because uh, a lot of things uh, that. We need to do as, as obstetricians and gynecologists requires physical contact with the patient. Um, and though sometimes, you know, our younger trainees feel that, you know, imaging and uh, uh, investigations give us the true picture. I think, uh, you know, uh, nothing really beats the, the, the amount of information that you get when you actually examine a patient uh, properly. And I think all of us know that. So it is very useful. It's useful in, I think that is a great place for telemedicine in triaging, especially in a situation uh, that, we, uh, that, that we are facing now where we don't want to congest hospitals unnecessarily. So you may be able to make some decisions. It is excellent when you're actually following up a patient because you can actually, you've already examined the patient, you're very familiar with that patient, and then you can actually use uh, telemedicine to make some decisions. Um, to some extent, uh, you know, the fact that, that uh, as you know, uh, we pick up a lot of cues from, from, from the way people speak and interact may help, but I would, still exercise great caution in making decisions if, if if i were to have to be in contact with a patient uh, using telemedicine for the first time because we do not have a patient doctor relationship at all expectations may be different uh, and uh, the fact that you are not able to examine may cause problems from from a legal perspective assuming the we uh, a doctor who knows a patient is uh, is uh, is uh, approached through the internet or through through the web and uh, for a consult but the patient's clinical documents are not in front of you and you make uh, you, 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 you and your treatment is not appropriate or it is skewed slightly what does that implicate me does that implicate the doctor i mean i'm not the doctor <laughs> Well, um, basically, as I mentioned during my presentation, the standard of care that the doctor must adhere to is very, very important. And there are a number of considerations as identified by the MMC and the MMA that we must take into account if a doctor wants to administer telemedicine. And even from the act itself, we must see that, you know, there are certain requirements that a doctor must fulfill even before telemedicine can be done. If the documentation is not before the doctor, and, you know, in the circumstance that he cannot make it a proper, uh, um, basically provide proper treatment and um, a diagnosis based on telemedicine as a, based on that. Um, and they can't comply with the guidelines set by the MMC or the MMA. And there is, if there, if there is a breach of the Telecommunications Act, then the <laughs> doctor will be, will be implicated in that sense. But as I mentioned as well, there is no case law at the moment. So until that actually happens, we it'll be interesting to see how the courts would actually approach the matter when the matter actually comes to court at the moment, yes. Thank you. Yeah, there's another question here about telemedicine from a, for a patient overseas. Um, 
what what about what what are your opinions about telemedicine for patients from the, from the overseas? Uh, uh, it's it's fine. Well, what's the question? The question is, you know, what 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 do you think? What are your opinions about carrying out telemedicine telemedicine consultations for a patient from overseas? Uh, you you have actually approached it in your talk. Um. So basically, um, in in my presentation earlier, given that there was no case loss from Malaysia, uh, what we did is actually we looked at a case law from the US, and basically in that case they established that, um, even through telecommunication, um, there is there exists a duty of care on the part of the doctor, and in circumstances such as that, um, the tele medicine in the same would operate in the same way as a classical medical negligence case so even if there is um even if the physical presence of the patient and doctor is not required um the relationship that exists would be able to give rise to a medical negligence even though it's done through the medium of telemedicine and that was a case which was decided in the us and in that case itself if i could go on to repeat it um Basically, the doctor had ordered the patient who was in labor to be transferred to the hospital after he had obtained information through the phone. And the court held that there is a doctor and relationship, um, relationship between the doctor and the patient as he evaluated the patient's condition through the phone and recommended treatment through the phone. So basically, in that circumstances, it does apply overseas, as we've seen in the US. And and based on the relationship of patient and doctor, the doctor would owe a duty of care to the patient. Uh, uh, when? Uh, yes. Was, was the question about a doctor? I, I, I think maybe we have misunderstood the question. Slightly. No, no, it was just was, whether it was advisable to carry out consultations for international yeah. patients. So a doctor overseas yeah. wishes, to, uh, uh, wishes to advise a patient in Malaysia. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Now, I think, I think uh, okay. Uh, 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 can I add on a little bit? I'd just like to add on a little bit. If the doctor is registered elsewhere mm -hmm. and, they wish, and they wish to have a, 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 a teleconsult with a patient in Malaysia, now there are two things that must be fulfilled. The first is the, the doctor must get a license from the uh, tele, uh, 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 for, for a teleconsult from the ministry, uh, from the MMC. And the second is they must work through a local doctor. Okay, right. Um, and there's a, what about jurisdiction? Because it's overseas, right? So that was one of the questions as well. Well, uh, jurisdiction. If you have got a if you have got a license to uh, to to give an opinion, uh, mm -hmm. uh, a teleconsult from from whichever country you're in for a Malaysian, mm -hmm. then that okay. takes care of that one issue. And you are uh, working through a local doctor. I suppose that's the reason why it's been it's been it's been yes. uh, uh, framed in this particular manner. Okay, so we've got another uh, uh, question actually. How would you get written informed consent for a telemedicine uh, consult via email or getting it at, uh, prior to physical contact uh, the physical consult itself? Because um, it was mentioned that we need to actually establish the rules before we proceed with the telemedicine consultation. So how would you go about doing that? Okay. Um, so uh, basically, um, on the issue of consent, um, perhaps what we can do is that um, we, since since we are talking about telemedicine, and as of now there is no fixed authority on this issue of consent. Basically, we have to rely on the Act. Now, the Act specifies that uh, consent must be written and has to be obtained. So, in such circumstances, perhaps we can be able to use the medium of email to actually. Um, obtain the patient's consent, given that um, it would be required before telemedicine can be administrated. But um, like I've said earlier, um, this issue has not come up in courts yet. So in the event that it does, we would be able to see how the court would actually analyze this sort of situation. Okay, that's great. Yeah, okay. Uh, with, uh, there's another question here that says, uh, when it comes to telemed uh, med uh, sort of telemedicine data, does it all have to be recorded or stored using a proper telemedical platform or can it be translated back and recorded in a written format in some physical notes, basically? Or do we need a special IT platform for a teleconsultation? Um, for, for a teleconsultation? Well, 
I'm I'm really not sure about this, but the one thing that I do know is that if you do do if you do have a teleconsult with the patient, you must take down a good history. You must have a recorded history and a recorded uh, uh, a recording of the events that took place and what you have uh, advised and all of that. I I, I suppose it can be uh, uh, written or it could be it could be uh, rec uh, you know in the form of a recording. But I, I, I'm I, quite... Uh... I, I'm not... I, I also wouldn't profess to... I wouldn't profess to know the answer, but I would think that um, uh, you need to explain this very clearly to the patient and right from the beginning. And I think you would be well advised to have the whole consultation recorded and then transcribed into a written format. And then uh, that, that written format with the records should be sent to the patient so that everybody is clear that this is what took place and and we have agreed that these are the decisions that were made uh, and if there is any dispute then you could actually fall back to the real-time recording to sort that out so yeah. i think it would be advisable to have this recorded how do how do the uh, the, law, uh, the courts do it now you now have uh, cases that you do online, is it? Yes. So basically what the courts have done during this pandemic is that some of our hearings, some of our case managements where we attend to actually update the court, they've actually moved it to an online platform. So basically um, on this online platform, we can actually see the judge, we can see our opponent, and we can all discuss the case as a whole. So basically um, as a res result of this pandemic, the courts have started to implement um, electronic means for actually for us to carry out our hearings and mentions and things like that. Well, well who keeps the records? The courts? Um, the courts will keep the records, yes. So basically, um, there are a number of ways. Um, there are times where we actually um, have a, like a video conference between the judge or the judge's assistant and the lawyers. There are times where we use our online e-review platform. So basically, that's like a chat room where each of us will type everything and then the court will give us directions. Or we can actually do it by email as well. So I will send an email first, and then my opponent will respond, and then the court will actually give directions. Okay. Sorry, just to um, just one last thing before we uh, actually break for the intermission. There was a little bit of misunderstanding. Sorry, with uh, with regards to the tele consultation for people for overseas. Actually, the doctor is from Malaysia, and they were asked. They've been asked to do um, telemedicine consultations first first time for medical tourism. So. What, where, where do our laws sort of, you know, do we have any laws governing that at all? Actually, our laws don't matter. It's the, it, it, uh, correct me if I'm yeah. right. Our laws don't matter. It's the laws in the, in, 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 in the country where the patient resides that actually matters. Okay, right. That's great. That, that's okay. my yeah. I, I just, just to add that, you know, the, the, the Canadian guideline just, also talks about uh, tele, tele, a teleconsultation that is just about uh, inquiry about wellness and a teleconsultation that actually uh, uh, discusses uh, uh, management and things like that. So uh, you have to distinguish between those two things as well. But I think the big problem is the fact that you don't have any case law and you don't have any precedence. And we are all depending on guidelines and we don't know how they, they actually pan out in the real world. Okay. Thank you so much for all the questions from the audience. We hope that we, we have got a few more, but we, I think that we will save that for the panel discussion. Um, so we shall now have a brief intermission. Uh, our sponsors, Dr. Shield, would now like to play a short uh, video. Um, and as part of our webinar today, we also have an e-exhibition hall, which can be accessed via the website below. Um, you can actually ac access it and you can actually view um, the videos again and also more information about our sponsor, Dr. Jim. So, um, so you can either access it from the, e uh, the um, email address down below or you can actually access it via your email and clicking on the QR code as well. So we shall now have a short intermission and we shall see you back soon. Okay. Hello, Dr. John. Do you know what is the claims process with Dr. Shield? A claim is a demand for civil compensation or civil damages or an intimation of an intention to seek such compensation. 
A circumstance is an intimation by a third party of an intention to claim against you or criticism of your performance where it may give rise to financial loss. Dr. John, do contact us as soon as practical. When a claim is made against you, all circumstances that may lead to a possible claim, all medical incidents that could potentially lead to a claim, and any regulator's inquiries. Don't worry, Dr. John, we have got you covered. Quick turnaround is ensured by using our online form submission for claims notification via our website. Your notification will reach us in real time and a lawyer will be activated immediately to advise you on the next course of action. Immediate legal advice is made available with a wide panel of medical legal expert lawyers across the country. They have been carefully handpicked to form our panel. A well-qualified lawyer will be engaged to assist you. However, should you have a preferred lawyer with medical legal experience, we will arrange for him or her to be approved quickly to represent your interests. We will arrange for consulting medical experts if necessary to clarify your situation at the onset of a claim. It is found that gaining such valuable opinions up front can aid to understand the situation better. Our objective is to help you achieve quick dispute resolution. We wish to assist you and the patient to move on without having to go through any more pain than necessary. In order to achieve effective dispute resolution, we fully support professional mediation. However, should mediation be unsuccessful, our expert lawyers will be able to move the case into litigation confidently. Oh, Dr. John. Do note that you should never do anything without your insurer's approval. Here are the top four crucial never-dos. Never settle or offer to settle. Never admit liability. Never enter into any claims correspondence. And never take any action which could prejudice the legal position or ability of the insurer to investigate the claim. Our claims philosophy is that medical malpractice is likely to have caused pain and loss to patients that cannot be always exacted with financial compensation. At the same time, it is our belief that no doctor would intentionally cause pain to any of his or her patients. Which is why we have made the Dr. Shield claims process very straightforward. Welcome back from our short intermission. We hope that you've actually managed to have some time to have a look at our virtual booths, uh, virtual exhibition booths. So we're going to now proceed with the second half of our medical legal webinar. Uh, and we hope that you found the first half quite interesting. So as mentioned previously, um, the pandemic has changed the way that we've practiced obstetrics and gynecology and in general just practicing of medicine. Non-essential -elect non elective surgeries have been delayed to make way for essential services. There is a reduction as well of your patients uh, for your outpatient clinics, and this might also have resulted in delayed treatments as well of patients. These are all obviously laced with uh, medical legal implications, and we hope that our next symposium will be able to address some of these issues. So our next speaker, Mr. David Timothy Kanagaratnam, is here today to represent Mr. Harikanan Raghavan, who was unfortunately unable to join us today as he had a family emergency. Mr. David Timothy Kanagaratnam is a legal associate at Nessus, Jayadeep, Hari and Jamil, and practices in the areas of general civil litigation, including medical and dental malpractice. He assist, assisted in medical and dental inquiries at the Malaysian Medical Council and the Malaysian Dental Council. We're pleased to welcome Mr. David as he gives his talk entitled, Delayed Treatments During a Pandemic, Are these are There Legal Implications? So, thank, you. thank you. Okay, so for my next topic today, um, I will be talking about uh, delayed treatments during a pandemic and whether there are in fact any legal implications. 
now for the purposes of this presentation, um, I would just I will just provide a brief background. I will then talk about the standard of care. Um, we will then talk about this topic of judicial review, and then we will look at some case laws um, regarding this issue. Now, just a little bit of background before I go into the main issues. Um, so basically, one of the major concerns that has caused delays in treatment during um, times of pandemic um, is the lack of hospital resources. Now, indeed, as we look at a majority of hospital resources have been diverted for the management of COVID-19, and this pandemic has actually caused one of the biggest healthcare crises crisis in the world and in history as well. Um, if we look at, at an excerpt that was quoted from the New Straits Times, um, basically a study was conducted which states that about 28.4 million planned surgeries could be cancelled or postponed globally due to the new coronavirus pandemic. And around 82% of Benin surgeries, 38% of cancer operations, and around a quarter of elective caesarean sections would be cancelled or postponed. Now, um, be before I go into this topic as to whether um, there is um, the legal implications surrounding delayed treatments during a pandemic, um, in the context of medical neg negligence, I would just like to address first whether a medical practitioner can actually be held liable for a delay in treatment in general. Now, in order to do this, we will look at the standard of care. Um, in the case of Zul Haslina Binti Hassan Basri and Dr. Kufu Belumani, um, as I mentioned previously as well, um, in this case, the court drew a di distinction between a diagnosis and treatment in medicine and the, due to advise, and the duty to advise patient of risk. Now, in terms of diagnosis and treatment, the court would rely on expert evidence. And in regard to the advice on risk, uh, the courts will determine this on their own. Now, um, coming back to diagnosis and treatment, uh, basically what the courts will do is that they would accept the views of a responsible body of men skilled in a particular discipline. The courts cannot resolve differences of expert opinions on their own, and the courts must still examine the expert evidence to see if it is capable of withstanding um, logical ana analysis. In terms of risk and complications, uh, based on the case of Rogers and Whitaker, as propounded here in our local case of Proof Fiona, um, the courts have held that doctors must take reasonable care to ensure that the patient is aware of any material risk involved in any recommended treatment and any reasonable alternative or variant treatment. Now, based on the standard of care, can a doctor be held liable if there is a delay in treatment? Um, let's look at a Malaysian case on this point. Now, in the case of Kamalan Raman and others, basically, um, in th this case was decided in 1997. Um, the brief facts of the case are as follows. The disease had episodes of giddiness for a period of time. And what had happened is that the doctors had failed to diagnose the disease early enough to detect that he was actually having a stroke. The patient was not ad admitted as there were generally inadequate medical facilities available for diagnosis and treatment to take place during um, the state emergency. And the court held that the doctors were liable as early detection and admission could have saved the patient's life. And as a result of the delay, um, the doctors were actually held li liable in this case. Now, if we look at a different jurisdiction which talks about delays, in Singapore, in this case, Noor Azmin Binti Abdul Rahman versus Changi General Hospital Private Limited and others. Um, this case was decided in 2019 and basically in this case there was a delay in treating the patient for her lung cancer and as a result of her delay as, as a result of the delay the her lung, lung can, her cancer was actually accelerated now in this case the court held that care provided by medical practitioners in an emergency care setting should be assessed in the context of the limitations of its high volume, high intensity, and the time critical and overwhelming environment. An accident and emergency doctor had to adopt a targeted approach 
and could reasonably prioritize diagnosing and treating presenting symptoms and eliminating life-threatening conditions. So therefore, from the two cases that I've just talked about, uh, we can see that indeed a doctor can be held liable if there are delays in treatment. So what happens if there is a delay in treatment as a result of insufficient resources as provided by a certain health authority? Um, where would the legal recourse lie for an individual? Now, um, if there are insufficient resources as provided by a health authority which has caused a delay in treatment, the recourse to an individual would be through judicial review. Now, I would just like to talk about um, this topic of ju judicial review and what it actually is. But um, before we do that, it is important to once again establish the duty of care. Now, in this British case of Hall versus Simons, which was decided in 2002, um, the court held that the doctor owes a duty to the individual pa patients, but he also owes a duty to his other patients, which may prevent him from giving one patient the treatment or resources he would ideally prefer. So in the context of tr delayed treatment, a doctor would owe, uh, definitely owe a duty of care to their patients. Now, if we look at this concept of judicial review, um, judicial review was basically defined as a process or mechanism where a person has been adversely affected by the, the decision of any public authority and therefore he can launch um, an application for judicial review. So in terms of this, the context of the late treatments during a pandemic, um, so an individual who is refused treatment due to restriction in resource allocation during a pandemic could challenge the resource allocation decisions by health authorities by way of judicial review. Um, judicial review is not concerned with the merits of a particular decision, um, but it concerns the process in which a decision was made and exercised. And it does not only just apply to a public authority, but it applies to a party basically exercising a public function. Um, in Malaysia, there have not been any local cases as of yet involving um, challenges of healthcare resource allocations. So uh, once again, what we'll do is that we will look at case laws decided from other jurisdictions to see how the courts have approached this issue. Now, um, before I do that, um, just to talk about talk more about judicial review, in order for an application for judicial review to be made, there are a number of legal requirements that must be taken into account. And as established in this case, Laguna Dibe Sindiran Berhad versus Mantis Prabandaran Subangjaya, there are basically three um, platforms in which one can uh, file an application for judicial review. Um, the first is on the issue of illegality. So basically, these are scenarios where decisions are made for improper purposes or where a public body has acted beyond the powers that were bestowed upon them. Um, the, the second element is that if there is any rationality or unreasonableness. So essentially, it, it, is, it is when a decision made by a public uh, body is irrational, unreasonable, and in the sense that their decision was so outrageous that it actually defies logic and uh, moral standards that no reasonable or sensible person would have actually arrived in making such a decision. And the final is procedural impropriety. Um, basically, this is a scenario where um, there is alleged bias and the um, basically the right to the, the person who is affected by the decision must be given the right to be given reasons for why a particular decision was made. Now, uh, coming back to the case laws, um, I'm going to look at case laws from the UK and to see how this um, the courts have actually approached this delay of um, treatment during a pandem pandemic. So the first case that I would like to look at is this case of our versus Central Birmingham Health Authority, um, ex parte Walker, that was decided in 1978. So basically, the brief facts of this case is that a baby required heart surgery. Um, it is important to note that this was not a life-threatening condition. 
and the surgery had to be postponed because um, there were more urgent cases to deal with and there were a shortage of specially trained nurses and accompanying facilities. So the court would, uh, what the court said was that they did not want to interfere in the decision of a health authority or surgeon and the court further stated that they would not substitute their own judgment for the judgment of those responsible for the allocation of resources unless they had acted so unreasonable um, which in this case the court found that they did not and in do doing so the court had to look at the clinical judgment of of the decision that was made and um, it is important to note however that in this case the patient's life uh, was not at an immediate risk so it would be interesting to see if the court had re would have reached a different decision if in fact um, this was a life-threatening situation if we move on to our next case in this case of r versus central birmingham health authority um ex parte, Col ex -parte collier that was decided in 1988 um in this case uh, a baby's heart surgery was postponed three times um, despite the urgency and the baby being placed on the priority list. And the reason for the, the three postponement, postponements was basically um, there was a lack of facilities and resources. Um, and here again, we can see that the court stated that they would not interfere in the allocation of resources um, in a hospital unless it is proven that the allocate, allocation of resources is so unreasonable in the Wednesbury sense. So basically what they are saying that um, they would only have um, interfered with the decision if it could be shown that the decision was so unreasonable, so outrageous that no uh, logical person would have actually come to that decision in regard to the allocation of resources, then the court would have interfered. However, the court in this case stated that they would not because they felt that the decision made by the health authority was indeed correct. And so, and one of the things which the court actually said in their judgment was that the court cannot arrange the list in the hospital and they should not be asked to intervene in these sort of issues. So uh, again, we can see, uh, it is important to note that the baby's heart surgery in this case, um, it did not pose an immediate risk to the baby. So yet again, it would be, would be very interesting to see if the courts would have come to a different decision um, in terms of the postponement that was made, if in fact it was a life-threatening condition. Now, the final case that I want to look at, also from the jurisdiction of the UK, is the case of R versus Cambridge Health Authority, ex parte B, that was decided in 1995. So in this case, um, a 10-year-old girl had lymphoma, and a second bone marrow transplant was registered, but the hospital refused treatment because of the unavailability, un unavailability of beds in the only national health service. So again, once again, the court took the approach that they were not in a position to decide on the correctness of the difficult judgments made by health authorities as to how a limited budget was best allocated to the maximum advantage of patients. So basically the court stated that um, difficult and agonizing judgments have to be made as to how limited resources are to be allocated to, maxim to provide maximum advantage to a maximum amount of patients. And this was basically a judgment call which the court said that it could not make. So um, we can see from the two cases that I talked about in the UK, um, the court has, there is a general sense of reluctance on the court to actually interfere with the decision of health of local health authorities in the UK when it comes to this issue of resource allocation. Um, but like I've stated earlier, in in these cases, the the conditions which which the patients were going through were not life threatening and they were not emergency procedures. So Yet, yet again, it would have been very interesting to see if the courts would have interfered and come to a different decision if the patient's lives were actually in danger. Now, uh, in Malaysia, there is no case laws as of yet, as this issue has not cropped up. Um, so until then, um, what, what we would do is that we would look at the UK authorities to provide us with guidance um, on this issue.
and that will be all for my second presentation today. Um, I would uh, thank you very, very, very much. And if any one of you would require um, further uh, reading materials or, or, or need further queries or information, um, you can always contact me at my email, david at jhj.com.my. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. David. Um, right, our next speaker um, is Professor Dato Dr. Tamasilan. He's currently a professor in Malacca Manipal Medical College. He's a fellow of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and is well published in several medical journals, as well as having a regular presence on TV and radio chat shows on medical legal issues. He has a law degree from the University of London and a postgraduate degree in medical law from the University of Northumbria. He's also served as a medical legal advisor for the Medical Protection Society and is currently the president of the Medical Legal Society of Malaysia, as well as being the head of the Medical Legal Subcommittee of OGSM. He will now present us with his talk entitled, Non-Essential Surgeries, When Is It Safe to Perform the Surgery? Thank you very much, Dr. for your right. presence. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, we're not moving. Sorry, we're having a few issues with the IT. Um, Dato, are you okay there? Mm, I'm fine. Okay. I think um, since um, we're having some issues, I think we'll just play a, a, a small video, a short uh, to a video from our sponsors, uh, whilst we set up while we settle this um, IT glitch. Okay. Hi Jan, now that we have a new requirement to have professional indemnity insurance in order to renew APC, I'm hearing many new options from many insurers. Can you quickly tell me about Dr. Shield and why it is best for me? Please keep your explanation to less than two minutes. When you start with us, it is important that only the historic liabilities are covered if the claim arises for the first time after you start with us. Should you retire or cease operations, you will be able to choose the unlimited runoff coverage that will protect you from liabilities arising in the future without requiring to pay premiums every year thereafter. We are the only scheme that allows you to engage the lawyer of your choice. In the event that you don't have a lawyer, you will be represented by our panel of carefully handpicked lawyers straight away. We charge a flat rate for all government doctors and specialists doing locum, regardless of their classification. An extraordinary deal for government doctors doing locum. For clinic owners registered as Sundarian Berhat, we provide clinic indemnity online for easy add-on to stay properly protected. We offer an option for auto reinstatement, double your coverage at 10% of your premiums. We fully support mediation as a preferred way of conflict resolution, minimizing the stress for all parties. We pay for aggravated damages and regulators' inquiries. This can sneak up when we least expect it. Always good to ensure this cover for peace of mind. We insure against personal accident and cover public relation costs for crisis management. We insure against cyber and data privacy loss. This includes loss of documents too. Lastly, you can get your instant codes and buy your policy within 10 minutes. You can renew your policy within 2 minutes. No printing of PDFs, no signing, no scanning, no account creation. We just want to make it easy for you. Giving you the assurance on your insurance. Wow, thank you, John. That was insightful. Back All right. Good afternoon. Yes. Thank you. Some technical problems. Can we start? Yes, please. Yep. 
Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Hope uh, all of you are still awake after a long session. Okay, I'm just going to briefly touch on uh, when is it safe to perform surgery, confining myself uh, to ONG. Uh, the references that I've used to in this talk, are one is by the Ministry of Health uh, on management of uh, COVID-19 obstetrics and gynecology that was updated on the 4th of uh, May 2020 and also the uh, guidelines by the American College of Surgeons when to do a surgery updated on March uh, 2020. See, unlike uh, other services, uh, obstetric services, uh, which includes early pregnancy care, remains an essential priority. You can't get away from doing antenatal services just because they are not urgent. The quality of provision of such services should continue without disruption despite this pandemic, although there can be modifications of care. Instead of giving, uh, say, uh, two weekly or maybe a weekly uh, follow-up, you can sort of uh, increase the uh, to maybe uh, three weeks, four weeks, depending on the situation of the patient. All frontline staff should adhere to MH uh, recommendation of the use of PPE, uh, should be updated on available guidelines on the management of COVID-19. Training on PPE should be extended to the concessionaire workers as well, not just the uh, permanent staff of the hospital. Screening of uh, patient under investigations and management of confirmed patients should be as per MOH guidelines. Suppose there is no designated ho hospital, there's an emergency, there is, every hospital should have a specific isolation room at the admission room, a labor suit, an OT to manage potential PUI who may be, who may present in imminent labor. Patients, of course, after stabilization can be referred to a designated COVID hospital. This is the flow chart on the patients uh, requiring surgery, delivery in tertiary hospitals. If it's life-threatening, and you're unable to access a patient, say fitting, say eclampsia, unconscious, shock, and they require surgery. Surgery is done in a C-19 hospital or referred to such hospital. And of course, surgery is done with appropriate uh, PPE. If no surgery is done, it can be admitted to a designated uh, room. And uh, swab test is done for C-19. And if there's a low probability of C19, you can admit the patient directly to any OBG ward. And uh, require surgery, okay, PPP requirement, and of course, routine or OT attire and using a face shield. If vaginal de delivery, a slightly more complicated maybe, you, you have to use scrubs, Close shoes, surgical mask, sterile gloves, non-sterile gloves, long sleeve plastic apron, eye protection shield, and goggles. That is for vaginal delivery. High probability of C19, you should ensure patient wears surgical mask. Patient send patient to emergency department where C90 uh, assessment area has been uh, designated to take a swab. Admit to designated uh, PUI and C19 unit after seen by assigned team. Follow C19 workflow. Oh, oh something is gone. Okay. Of course, uh, assessment of ONG patients requiring admission for surgery or delivery in hospitals. First, you take uh, history from the patient or family members, close contact or any clusters, had traveling history to affected countries, 
lives in a red zone in the country or any symptoms of fever, URTI, breathing, red eye, loss of smell and others of fever within the last 14 days. Physical examination, if the patient has got fever or lungs has got crepitation or added sounds on auscultation, then you, you, you investigate the patient further. Abnormal chest x-ray, lung ultrasound, full blood picture. High risk group are those who have got immunocompromised, who are elderly, more than 60, cancer patients, comorbidities like gestational diabetes or diabetes mellitus. If any of the above is present or in combination, proceed as high probability. Chest x-ray is required for all non-pregnant women. Chex H3 is not mandatory for a pregnant woman. And if it's mandatory, if it has to be done, then do it with an abnormal shield. If the surgery is to be done, it's advised to use regional anesthesia rather than general anesthesia. If GA is required, induction and reversal should be done in a negative pressure ventilation room with staff optimizing an and enhanced PPE equipment, which includes a PP power air purifying respirator suit, which the surgeon too has to wear. Patients in labor should be offered a C-section as mode of delivery in view of lack of negative pressure ventilation in most labor rooms. So you, if you see all just the oxygen just comes in, the air comes in, but there's nothing to suck it out. So that there's no negative pressure actually in most labor rooms. So that's why a C-section is offered. But again, vaginal delivery is not contraindicated if the patient is in imminent labor. The patient should use a surgical mask a face shield and staff should also use PPE. Handling of body fluids, the placenta, specimens including uh, placenta should be handled based on standard universal precautions. If medications like hydroxychloroquine, aspirin, corticosteroids have to be used, they can be used because they are not contraindicated even among the PUI patients. Although breastfeeding is not an absolute contraindication, the risk of transmission from a symptomatic mother remains a concern. So normally they ask you not to give breast milk, but use expressed breast milk rather than breastfeeding directly if breastfeeding is required. Consider venous thromboembolism if there are no contraindications, electric surgeries may be offered a screening test depending on the availability of resources. Although a routine chest x ray for all pregnant mothers is not practical, just because you need to confirm uh, C19, do not delay the surgery if the surgery is needed. And of course, the operating team should wear appropriate PPE to perform the surgical procedure if the patient's status is unknown. Okay, this is a scoring system devised by the American College of Surgeons in March 2020. It's also known as uh, MENS. Uh, the that means the scoring system is uh, from 0 to 4 and 4 plus. So the scoring is taken on the procedure itself, how long the surgery will take, how, whether the patient will require an ICU bed, how much of blood the patient will lose, how many surgeons and nurses are needed in the OT, whether a ventilator will be needed after surgery. In surgery, is in the abdomen. Of course, in gynae, it will be more of an abdomen, so it will be, be lower risk compared to a surgery on the upper abdomen, 
disease is non-operative uh, treatment available? Would the outcome of the illness be impacted by a two-week delay? So surgery is uh, as far as possible for unknown uh, status to postpone surgery by at least two weeks. Better still if we can postpone it by six weeks if there is no urgency. And then uh, patient issues for the scoring system. How old is the patient? Less than 20, the lowest risk, more than 65, highest risk. Whether the patient has got breathing issues, heart disease, diabetes, immune system weakened, acute respiratory infection. Do they have known C19 exposure in the past two weeks? And this is the uh, scoring system where you give score for each individual item from one to more than four, four and more than four. And it ranges from 25 to 105. So this is the, if it's uh, 25, it's okay to proceed. If it's more than 80 to 105, then you don't proceed if you can avoid it. But if you need to do it, then you do it with uh, all the necessary care that you do when you operate on a C19 patient. Take home message will be try to fix, if not urgent, the surgery, fix it for surgery after 14 days. Hopefully the symptoms will, will, will uh, arise before the 14 days. If surgery is needed, then according, then you grade it. If you need to do surgery according to the comorbidities, not mandatory to do a C19 test if there are no symptoms, right? And uh, x rays are needed as required. And there's no need for routine swab tests on all patients that get admitted for surgery. Thank you. I think that will be uh, a short talk on basic uh, care that's needed for non essential surgery. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dato. Uh, we will thank you very much. We will now let's call for questions from our audience for our Q and A session. So again, as before, to ask questions, please log on to www.slido.com uh, with the event code uh, hash OGSM2020, or you can join by scanning the QR code. So we're looking forward to um, some questions from our audience. Our panelists are all ready and waiting. Ask yeah, uh, when while yes. you are waiting for the questions, can I ask uh, uh, Mr. David here a question? Of course. Okay. Now, uh, David, I, I'd like to know you see, uh, uh, we have a pandemic and it does, it's across the board, and uh, we have various authorities managing this pandemic in different ways. Like, for example, in Malaysia, we looked at containment. Yep. And uh, there are other uh, uh, authorities or regions where they looked at uh, things like herd immunity. Now, assuming an individual or a group of individuals uh, in, uh, in uh, say, we now know that containment was, uh, was uh, uh, better than, you know, looking for, uh, than awaiting herd immunity. Now, assuming uh, someone in, in, in a region which practiced herd immunity, uh, wishes to ask for a judicial review of their health authority. Is that allowed? Well, um, in, when, when we talk about judicial review, basically it applies to any decision made by a public body or a public authority. So in the event that the decision that they are unhappy with is in fact a public decision, they are allowed to challenge that decision. However, um, like I've mentioned during my talk, it has to be premised on three possible factors. The decision must be so improper, the decision must be so unreasonable, or the decision must have been biased in some way. So if if the the, the if the decision made falls into one of those category, categories, provided it is a public decision, then you can make an application for judicial review. Will will an uh, 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 an economic uh, uh, outlook? Meaning that uh, between between the health of the community and the economic uh, uh, impact on the community, do you think the looking at the economic impact 
a pandemic would have on the community is uh, acceptable as something that is uh, that that is irrational and uh, which falls within your yeah, yeah. artist. So basically, um, if it is an economic decision, and if it is in terms of, like I've mentioned, um, resource allocation, where um, a decision is made where the the, the resource allo allocation which has been allocated, um, and someone is unhappy with that deci decision, in the event that if it is if, if it is a scenario like that, then yes, I do think the concept of judicial review will apply. Right. Okay. Uh, when any questions so far? Um, we haven't had any uh, new questions yet, but so I just thought that maybe we could ask, um, just maybe address one of the questions that was uh, asked earlier on. So, um, is there a medical legal issue with teleconsultation with non-HIPAA compliant platforms such as WhatsApp, non-HIPAA non uh, compliant platforms such as WhatsApp or WeChat? Um, is there any, any medical le uh, medical legal issues using these uh, platforms for your teleconsultations? Um, oh, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, actually, to be very frank with you, um, I do not have the answer to that question because um, I don't believe an issue like that has prompted has actually occurred as of yet. But um, what I can do is that um, if anyone is, is interested to know the answer to that question, um, you can always email me. And what I can do is that I can conduct some further research and provide you with reading materials and um, to address that question. But um, as of now, um, I have to be frank that um, there hasn't been an issue on this yet. So I can't really give you a definite answer. Okay. Uh, Dato, do you have any views on this? Uh, no, no, I really don't think uh, it's still a hazy area, not uh, as I think uh, 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 Karangaranam said just now. I mean, we do not have any decided case laws. We all are depending on MMC guidelines. And until we have such a case, then only I think the uh, the borders will be more well drawn. So I don't think at the moment mm -hmm. I, I, I would, I'll delve into it, I'll jump into it. Okay. Would it be right to say that now, in the absence of uh, case law, <laughs> uh, we actually get into this uh, thing that what we do is in good faith and that uh, uh, would it be uh, perhaps in the interest of the doctor to actually uh, uh, frame the borders of the discussion very clearly <laughs> between what is just a casual consult because if if you look at the remote uh, definition, it, it, it is not con it is not defined by 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 separation. Yes. So if we were talking about about something, and then you ask me something about health, and then I answered you, that is could also later be, be defined as a teleconsult. So if do we need to make those borders very very clear? Um, I do think that is very important. We do need to make those borders very, very clear. Um, it is still a very, a very hazy area. And of course, if there are any legal challenges, it would be good that all the necessary framework is already in place. You see, and all the uh, proper uh, documentation and everything is already in place. It would facilitate the legal process. So I do, do think it is very important. Yes. Okay. Well, are there any? I think there are no other questions. So I think uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a short break and then we will come back um, and prepare for the panel discussion. So um, just so just a small housekeeping announcement for um, for all our all our participants. There is a, after this web webinar is over, all participants will be sent an email with a link to a quiz uh, where where once you've answered it and sent it in, you can get CPD points. And as well as the link as well to download your certificate of participation. So um, before we proceed with our panel discussion, we're just going to play a short video. Okay.
Welcome back, back. Um, everybody. So we are now pleased to welcome our esteemed speakers um, to the panel discussion. The talks today have been very stimulating, and I think that probably has stimulated a lot of questions as well from the audience. So we would now like to invite our audience to join us again by logging on to www.slido.com and entering our uh, event code, and also all by scanning the QR code. Okay. So the first question, we've actually got one question. Um, what is the uh, ONG doctor's liability to staff and other patients if your patients do not reveal accurate COVID-19 risk factors and the patient later turns out to be COVID-19 positive? So are you liable to your staff and other patients if, let's say, the patient um, does not reveal accurate information about their risk factors and actually turns uh, out to be... Would you like to take that question? Yeah, I, I think uh, it is. Uh, I mean, I, I think a similar case happened uh, in uh, in one of the private hospitals in Malacca recently, where the uh, patient, having known that she was uh, a risk factor for COVID nineteen, did not reveal the uh, factors to the surgeon, and uh, I think the uh, hospital actually uh, had to close down for four days. For so there was a massive loss for them. And I think they were contemplating uh, suing the patient. But I think uh, they couldn't do it because I don't think there is any law. But I think when you look at uh, general law as it stands, I think that's bullfield deceit to, and, and not giving the full facts. There may be a case, but but I think uh, what the hospital did was took, took the easy way out. They, they I didn't, didn't file a case, but probably gave her a very hefty bill uh, to to compensate for the the time <laughs> that they would probably send in the courts, I don't know whether Terence has I mean uh, whether Kana has got any. Uh, well, there are, there are really no case laws yet as such, but I do not know whether in other fields whether there is willful deceit, not informing facts and uh, resulting in damage would would. Uh, I think the law would apply in in, in those scenarios, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I believe the law would apply in just that scenario. But however, ever like you've mentioned, Professor, um, there isn't any case laws as of yet here. And based on my research as well of other <coughs> jurisdictions, um, there, there doesn't seem to be any, anything on this point as of yet. This is a very novel issue. Um, so it would be interesting to see when this issue actually comes before the court. Uh, but in the context of the medical, in, in the medical context, if a patient does come and is suspected of COVID testing, uh, would the doctors actually care? The doctors would have to carry out all the necessary investigations and tests if the person is suspected, I believe. So, if that is the scenario, um, I don't think we would have a situation where the patient would um, be hiding the fact that they have COVID, considering the public hospital would have done all the necessary tests, all the necessary investigation to ensure that the patient would or would not have um, COVID. Um, no, actually, that's not quite right. Mm -hmm. the, the reason being, uh, uh, I must get your permission before I test you for, for COVID. You know, and if you do not give me permission, I I I I probably uh, I can't test you for COVID. You know, uh, am I right? Yeah. Can no, I can I, I can I yeah. answer that a bit? Can uh, I answer that? Yes. Okay. I think the law provides for it. You know, in the sense that there is an Infectious Diseases Act, Correct. where you are mandated to reveal uh, your infectious disease uh, status. If not, I can do the test on you. And if you don't do the test, uh, it, it is mandatory that I can I can do a test on you. Say so just like HIV, uh, all the all the contacts I trace all the contacts, and I have to do a mandatory test on them. Uh, and uh, I don't need your real uh, consent to do it uh, because you have to do it. It's 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 a crime by law that if you, if you don't uh, you don't allow your blood to be test, tested for such designated infectious diseases, but whether COVID nineteen falls under that, that's uh, that's that's another query, lah. But if it falls within that, if, if it is it is if it is uh, legalized and legislated as another infectious disease where you need to inform the the state, then I think uh, I think uh, uh, he can be tested. And I think if he refuses to be tested, I think the the hospital has the right to refuse surgery too. That's my interpretation. 
uh, or that's what I think personally. Yeah, the the, the loss during a pandemic, uh, yeah. uh, 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 loss related to public health, and loss related to public health generally. Uh, community driven as opposed to individual uh, based yep. on individual rights now in a pandemic like this do this uh, uh, are there laws to tell us that we can test anyone who comes in uh, and who requires surgery of course no. we need to yeah we, we 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 need to definitely test because uh, it is classified as infectious disease where diseases need to be tested they need to be tested so, just um, like I, 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 just like a patient cannot, uh, patient on legitimate grounds can refuse to do an HIV, but if he's suspected to have HIV, then he has to do it. Husband and wife. Uh, find out because um, I think the, the current scenario in Malaysia is that you test based on uh, risk. So the, the patient actually, when you come in, fills up a certain form that, and then you, you sort of decide whether this patient has got the possible risk factors for COVID and then you test. But there's another, this one, there's another group of patients who can actually be test negative, uh, or sorry, can test positive even when they are asymptomatic. So that group of patients you would probably miss in our current testing scenario. Then the third group is, uh, can we fall back on things like uh, uh, other diseases, like for example, Ebola, you know, where you may not have tested positive for Ebola, but you have very generic symptoms like fever and a rash and things like that. So, you know, that could be consistent with any viral disease. But, um, um, but if it later turns out that you have Ebola or you had this, then uh, what is the liability? If you did not, like say, okay, say you presented with a fever and a rash, but you have been to a country where Ebola was prevalent, you hit that, you know, the doctor in good faith thought that, well, you had a viral fever, perform surgery on you, and later somebody in the team gets infected because of exposure to bodily fluids or something like this. Now what happens? Okay, um, so in this sort of scenario, um, if we look at the Infectious Disease Act, it would apply to all infectious diseases and primarily to COVID at this juncture. Now, if we look at the Act, we can see that an uh, authorized officer can compel a patient to actually go for testing and treatment based on the symptoms of the patient. So basically we can see that um, a health authority has the power to actually compel a patient to go for treatment and the patient cannot refuse this because if, if I suspect you of having an infectious disease and you don't, and if you don't go for the necessary testing or treatment, the patient is actually liable under the act. So I believe section 24 of the act says that um, a patient can actually be fined. So if you are suspected of treatment and a public officer compels you to go for treatment and you still refuse, you will be fined under the act. Okay. okay. Well, is that answer sufficient? Um, yeah, I think there is, but there's a follow-up question actually. So let's say you have a patient and your patient has refused a COVID screening test. Can you refuse to treat them? I think sure. I think of course, you, you, you because the law mandates that you should do it, and I can refuse. It's not that uh, in certain, circ circum circum certain circumstances, you can refuse the patient when the patient doesn't want uh, surgery. Just like a patient can refuse consent for surgery, a doctor, when 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 indicated where you're going to be infectious, you don't need to be tested. And especially if it's not an emergency, I don't think I, I, I'm obliged to do that. Yeah. Are yeah. we liable to if we if we refuse some treatment? Yeah, we are like we are not we are not liable because you are you are you are the one who's creating the 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 scenario for me not to operate on you. You are not giving me the chance to operate on you because you have not done just like we do routine blood test. Mm -hmm. We do routine H H B. We do uh, B U S C and all that. And if we find that it is raised or something, we don't do the surgery. So you cannot tell the 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 doctor. Uh, you do the surgery even though my HB is low, even though my BUSE is low, my creatinine is, I, I might die under anesthesia, but you must do the surgery. Cannot. So there are circumstances where I think the law will be, I think, uh, I mean, they will take, it's, it not, it's not fixated on no, the law in the sense that they will also take into consideration the other views. Uh, just like what just now, uh, uh, 
Ganagarandam said about uh, where the, the hospital can choose because of available resources, available resources, available staff, not available, no, no facilities. I can refuse surgery. And here I'm refusing surgery because you don't want to be tested. Mm -hmm. Because I suspect that, I mean, of course, uh, again, like uh, what the law says, it should be reasonable, reasonable suspicion. Why I'm suspecting, why I don't want to do, why I need to test you. Not that you are any normal patient walking. You have got symptoms. You are coming from a, a, a designated COVID-19 area. You have traveled to an area where it, there is COVID-19. So I need to test you before I do it. Because I'm going to put the community, I'm going to put the hospital at, at risk just because of you. So I think you are justified in refusing uh, to do surgery when I don't want to do the test. When it's reasonable that I should do the test on you. Any other comments based on this um, on, on this question? No, I, th I think uh, I think I think David actually answered the question uh, as well. It is with his previous answer. So I think what uh, Dr. Osi is quite uh, yeah. uh, uh, appropriate. Okay, right. So the next question is: My patient was in contact with a COVID positive patient whilst in hospital. Am I liable? So let's say you, yeah. You, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, I think you would have to look at the circumstances. How did the patient actually come into contact with this other patient who had COVID? I mean, the patient, when you're in a hospital, you are under the care of the specialist, you're under the care of the hospital. So I think we, um, in order to answer this question, we need to look at the circumstances involved. How exactly did this patient come into contact with this other patient as COVID? Wouldn't patients who have COVID be isolated in a separate yes. ward? So how did this patient actually come into contact with this patient who has COVID? Um, I think with that information, um, it depends on the circumstances, I would have to say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ganesh? I also think so. Because I think unless uh, the hospital or the treating physician did not follow the regulation, I don't see how the physician can be uh, held liable. Because we've got all the SOPs in place, and okay. if all that was followed, but the patient still wandered into a COVID ward or did something silly, then uh, I don't think the, the treating yeah. physician would is, like is yeah. uh, uh, liable. I think it's a known uh, it's a known uh, fact that uh, many patients uh, develop certain diseases in the hospital. Hospital infections they are so common. I mean, uh, you can come to hospital, you get treated for something, but you get something else. I, so I don't think, uh, so far, I don't think there's any case where somebody has taken uh, us to court because they developed something in the hospital, which is which is a known risk because everybody in the hospital is a sick person. So you, you may contact anything. So you cannot hold, the, the, the hospital cannot be responsible to ensure that uh, when you're getting into hospital, it's also a known risk that you're going to contact other diseases. It cannot be free from other diseases like, con co completely, right? Yeah. Well, of course, the high-risk cases, they are put in infectious wards. But in a general ward, uh, getting a cough, that's why you develop antibiotic resistance. That's why you develop so many other diseases. So it is It is not... Uh, I don't think the, the, the courts will just uh, even hear this case, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, it, it, I, I, I feel that it's quite similar to getting it in the market. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, true, true. That is true, yes. Yeah. Probably worse, I think. <laughs> so um, there's another question here with regards to teleconferencing. Um, for telemedicine, am I still liable if the teleconsultation was free? Yeah, the answer is yes. Right. Okay. Does it differ if the t the consultation was in the private sector or in the government sector? It doesn't matter. I think so. It doesn't matter. A consultation is a consultation. You know, whether you pay for it or you don't pay for it, it is still uh, you're still liable if if if, 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 it, if it were given. Tato, do, uh, you, do you agree? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Definitely, I think it, it's it's sensible. I think logical. So there's another question here. In your opinion, is there a potential for new cases to be managed through telemedicine only in the future? 
uh, what kind of cases would it be? Someone um, mentioned uh, psychiatry because um, the, I think David mentioned that um, patients with, uh, you know, who, are, who may have psychiatric problems may be difficult to assess or, uh, via telemedicine. So I think, I think uh, oh, the second talk, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, uh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, carry on. Yeah. So would you consider telemedicine in psychiatry follow up? No, um, I think I think Doctor Doctor Ganesh has answered this question earlier. I'll let him uh, address the question again. Yes. Um, okay, I think it's it's really uh, you know um, I think the, the just like I think the most important thing is that what we are doing is we do in good faith, you know, and uh, we make judgments based on on how the teleconsult goes. And if in the judgment of the doctor there is a psychiatric or a cognitive impairment which may make it very difficult to uh, conduct that, that consultation, then uh, it should draw to a close. And then you should say that this patient needs to go to a facility where we can see each other uh, face to face. So I think that's how it stands. And I think it's very similar to what we do in the, in the real world. Because if I had, if I were to see a patient with a gynecological problem or an obstetric problem, and in during the consult, I find that there could be a psychiatric comorbidity. What would I do? I would refer that patient to a psychiatrist. You know, if, if I were to continue treating that psychiatric problem without the sufficient expertise, then I would be at, I would be liable. So if you have already, I think uh, the way things stand, we, we do telemedicine on good faith and we draw the boundaries. And I think when we feel that, that the boundaries are being breached, then we, as a physician, I think it is my responsibility to say that we should now end the consultation in this form and take it to a form where I can actually see the patient and make, make the necessary uh, judgments or necessary decisions. If we don't do that, I think we'll be liable. Yes. If we do that, I don't think we are liable. So yeah, I think we actually have quite a lot, uh, probably some non uh, obstetricians and gynecologists following this forum. So I think um, that that's why we're getting questions asking about other specialties as well. Um, someone asked, how do we establish the rules of a telemedicine consultation with the patient? Um, I think it was addressed probably a bit earlier with regards to consent. Um, but uh, obviously, I think written consent was, was one of the things that we needed to consider, right? I think basically uh, what I think we are actually uh, getting a little bit wary about telemedicine. I think the same rules apply as we are doing consultation. I think what will a reasonable doctor ask the patient? What a reasonable doctor think should have, should have asked? I think everything is the same. The scenario is the same. It's just that the telecommunication comes in between. Maybe if I have not examined, maybe, but consultation, I think what? A doctor should be doing an, in a normal consultation. He should be doing over the telemedicine uh, consultation. So I think the I think we should really not get too carried away and get too frightened about tele. I think that's going to be the future. You know, I think less and less people are going to come for online. I mean, they they have now found that uh, telemedicine. See, now we are teaching online, and I think that the future will be teaching will be most of it online rather than you see people are sitting at home and. Uh, probably they are, they are sitting in the uh, underwear and listening to your talk, or they are probably having a drink and uh, listening to your talk, and that's what a consultation is going to be. That's go that's what the future is going to go. I mean, uh, we should not, and, and I don't think we should get very worried about it. What we do in practice, normal practice, we follow the same rules in telemedicine. So, what is informed consent? What is this? All same thing. Only thing is here. It's much more evidential in the sense that you are recording everything that you are saying. It may be less evidential when you in consultation where you are writing, you miss out everything. Here, it makes it easier for you. You are talking everything; everything is recorded, every word is recorded. So, I think uh, that will be the future. And telemedicine, I think the COVID nineteen has has made an impact in, in the way that we are going to practice medicine in future. Mm -hmm. True. I, 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 I think that was answered the question. I think if you are uh, the, 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 uh, the, the only thing that we need to address 
uh, everything is the same. The only thing we need to address is a proviso stating that, look, I've not examined you yet, you know, and therefore, uh, uh, they, they, you know, uh, you may need to get examined at some point in time, you know, and we should address that. Okay. Yep. So, yeah, I think that's important. Very important, uh, really. I think that's important. I think there must be a provisio and there must be a caveat. I'm only uh, coming to this diagnosis with whatever you are telling me. What the, with the limited resources I have, with the, with the limited examination I have, this is. I think we should also. Uh, it's just like how we have drawn up consent forms, so legally correct. We also have to do it legally correct when you commit, uh, get consent in <clears throat> telemedicine too. So would you advise us to record our telemedicine consultation? Definitely, definitely. Yes. Get, I, think, I think the most important thing is to tell the patient that I'm recording it and uh, you record it. I mean, don't record it without this. Tell him, tell me I'm recording it as an old president and I think you should record it. I think every telemedicine thing has to be recorded. Okay. Yeah, I think so too. Because I think I think you you set the boundaries. You tell the patient that this is going to be recorded, and I think it is to the mutual benefit of both the physician and the patient mm -hmm. if it is recorded, yeah. because then that nothing is left to uh, conjecture or doubt. Yes. Uh, if, if it's recorded. Yeah. So, I think. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. No, no. Carry on, please. So there's one more question here that says uh, many people are posting professional opinions online. Would I be liable for what I post on social media? Would this be considered a consultation? First and foremost, you never post professional opinions online. I think I think something must be wrong with you if you post a professional opinion online. You know, so uh, that goes off. Now, um, uh, so so I, I I don't think the rest of the the rest of it needs to be answered, lah. You know, I can see your question from here. I think you will be liable. You know, I think you should be liable. You know. Okay. Um, now, is that the end? Um, right. I think um, at the moment, I think that those are the... Hold on, let me just double check. Um, I think at the moment, there are no further questions. Um, so I think from the summary of this panel uh, discussion, we've decided, you know, we've... we've I think that was very good advice that was given. So to record your consultations, get consent prior to the consultation and set boundaries. I think that's very important with um, our with the telemedicine um, consultations. Um, are there any other questions that um, the panelists would like to ask? No, uh, but I'd like to state something. You know, okay. listen. Uh, if 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 when you give when when you go to court and you give opinions on medical uh, disputes, you will find that lots of time. Uh, uh, lots of times, the, the dispute is on uh, disclosure, meaning that the patient will probably turn around and say, I, you have not told me this. You have not said that this uh, 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 complication can occur. You know? So I think actually recording it online and having a uh, recording uh, 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 this thing of uh, a uh, 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 video recording of whatever transpired in your during your 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 uh, counseling of the patient is is an excellent thing because then then you have you have uh, physical evidence to say that look like i've said this and you agreed to it you know right now we we, we depend on paper and somebody signs a, a, a <laughs> consent form and then later turns around and tells you that look like i didn't know i was asked to sign in this place and i signed mm -hmm. so having Something like this, I think, is the way forward. And I think it's a very good thing that it's going to happen now. So I, I, I don't think we should, uh, we should, uh, we should be uh, wary of it. I think we should embrace it because this is actually the future. Um, there was an opinion, actually, from the, from the, uh, from the floor. Uh, something about uh, be careful with recordings. Uh, the legal and MMC guidelines uh, on how such recordings are stored security and transmission etc will apply so do you have any opinions about the guidelines by mmc about how these recordings should be stored and also security and transmission i think that is standard procedure for all even our records that we uh, sort of manually write it down we are supposed to keep it for a certain number of years we are supposed to keep it so that nobody else sees it of course we don't we don't i mean everything applies the same thing applies 
so you you need to keep your recordings for three years. You need to store it. You don't transmit it. Even what's please please understand even WhatsApp messages. Uh, some of you do WhatsApp consultation, which is very dangerous because WhatsApp message WhatsApp consultation can be transmitted and forwarded. So I I think you should ensure that what you are telling the patient also is not transmitted. It's not the other way around too. Both ways you you are liable if what consultation you give is also transmitted and it can cause problems. So you must be careful in that matter. You, 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 your, your telemedicine portal should be also secure. Okay. So um, I've just also had another message from the floor. Um, I've been told to um, to just uh, to talk to, to just mention that storing in your personal computer hard drive is not acceptable apparently. So apparently that is also um, can be hacked and obviously you can lose that information as well. So I think there are medical legal implications with uh, storage of of the uh, patient um, patient information on your hard drive as well. So um, on behalf of OGSM, I would like to um, thank everybody for your time um, and thank all the speakers for you know for actually giving us such a you know a lot of enlightening talks with regards to medical legal um, I'm sorry, um, med medical legal issues with regards to COVID nineteen. Um, we also have to thank our sponsor. Um, uh, uh, our sponsor, you know, who's actually Dr. Shields, who's actually been very good um, and sponsored this um, medical legal webinar as well. So thank you very much, panel. Uh, have a great day and um, goodbye. Thank you. Um, as for the audience, um, please uh, realize that you can actually access the talks. Um, you can still access our website and you can access the talks at a later time as well. So on behalf of OGSM, thank you again, everybody. We hope that you have a very nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.